Hello and welcome to another frontline update from ATP Geopolitics. Myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce, for the seventh of January, twenty twenty-three. Let's get straight to the overnight news and other news. Uh, quite a bit to say today, so I have to rattle through it so we can get to the front lines in a timely fashion. The figures released by the Ukrainians for the Russian losses yesterday, uh, all the usual caveats, propaganda, inaccurate, Russians don't produce the same numbers. We've seen a downtick today, 490 liquidated personnel, so that it's uh, good. We were seeing mid 700s, late 700s over the last week, and that's dropped back down to fewer than 500. Two tanks, one APC, three artillery systems, two anti aircraft systems. Don't often see too many of them on one fuel tank or vehicle. We had a massive number for vehicles lost yesterday, a huge losses in tanks, APCs, and uh, vehicles and actually quite high artillery systems losses and MLRS over the last few days. That's gone right back down to a negligible number. So I don't know what that represents. Uh, it could have been just a, a whole bunch of uh, figures for yesterday that were that accumulated over several days and they just happened to hit on one day, or whether that was actually the losses that took place the day before, I don't know. Um, on the flip side, here's some footage. So we had two days in a row where the Ukrainians shot down Su-25, all fixed-wing aircraft, and uh, Ka-52 attack helicopter. So two of each were lost. Uh, the Russians have shot down a Ukrainian Su-25 over Bakhmut. And here's the footage. I'll take off the sound uh, because music comes on. I might get a copyright infringement. Um, so you see it uh, fall over Bakhmut after it's been hit, uh, apparently, by a man pad. Uh, and then there's drone footage of it burning in the midst of Bakhmut. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, that's obviously going to be a big loss for the Ukrainians. As I always say, it's not just in terms of the plane itself, the hardware, although that will be a huge loss more so for, for the Ukrainians than the Russians, but it is also the crew. So it's whether the pilot was lost or not, and that's huge important. I didn't see a parachute in any of that footage. But anyway, that is uh, not good news for the Ukrainians. Bakhmut in general is not good news. Uh, Ukrainian sources are now confirming this is in Tokmak was another disaster for Russia. So this is a strike on Tokmak, I think, two nights ago. It takes a couple of days for the details to come through. So Ukrainians no longer believe in the Soviet creation of Father Frost, but they believe in HIMARS. Around 200 more newly mobilized invaders thought to be dead. So that's a huge hit in Tokmak. And that might be where they hit an accumulation in a hospital. Um, uh, so because they often use sort of schools and hospitals for troop accumulations in the hope they don't get hit. Um, this is Russia on fire again. The foreign ministry building in Moscow caught fire today. That was yesterday. No reason being given, uh, but it said the blaze started in a technical room. Um, so there you go. The foreign ministry on fire. Again, the, this is happening quite a lot at the moment and is potentially indicative of partisan activity. Uh, in the heart of Russia. Uh, there was a ceasefire called Yes, yeah, so Some people are saying the ceasefire is supposed to start this morning at midnight, as in, you know, on midnight of the 6th to 7th. Uh, others saying it should have started at midday yesterday. But, you know, for, for, for a ceasefire, if it was yesterday, for a ceasefire being called, uh, Russia have done a heck of a lot of fighting and, in fact, taken the most land they have done in months. So, uh, yeah, during the nine years of the war, the Rus so this is since 2014, the Russian Federation has never adhered to the ceasefire agreements. This was announced by Deputy Minister of Defence of Ukraine, Anna Malia. Yeah, uh, this is the big news. So the US has produced another aid package, announced another aid package, and the aid package is really significant. So let's really quickly go through that. 50 Bradley IFVs uh, with 500 tow anti-tank missiles and 250,000 rounds of 25mm ammunition. Wow. 100 M113 armoured APCs. So these are old school APCs, been around since the 60s, been around uh, in a whole bunch of wars. I mean, look at all these wars that they've been used in various uh, sort of countries, but particularly America ha have used them. Um, they are just pretty old school, but if you want to move some... Uh, troops around and you you don't these aren't necessarily going to be on the front line these can be on the borders so on and so forth uh yeah really useful 55 mraps so mine resistant ambush protective vehicles 138 humvees uh 18 
155 mil self-propelled howitzers and 18 ammunition support vehicles, 70,000 155 artillery rounds, 500 precision guided artillery rounds. That's important. Excalibur, possibly other types. 1,200 155 mil rounds of remote anti-armor mine, uh, 36 105 millimeter towed howitzers. Uh, and then we've got all this sort of rounds, uh, ammunition for high Mars, RIM-7. So these missiles can be used in a book uh, and uh, surface-to-air missile system. Zuni aircraft rockets, 4,000 of them. 2,000 anti-armor rockets, probably javelins, sniper rifles, machine guns, ammunition for grenade launchers, small arms, claymore anti-personal mines, night vision devices, optics, spare parts or other field equipment. Okay, absolutely brilliant. I mean, obviously the 50 Bradleys is huge. But actually snuck in there is this 18 155 millimeter self-propelled howitzers and their support vehicles. So actually, what these 155 SPGs are look look to be these M109, definitely extremely suitable for the war in Ukraine. The, this is brilliant, right? But also there's a, a shed load of these in Ukraine at the moment already, provided by the US, but provided by a bunch of other nations as well. And this is such a good article, well worth reading, a Forbes article, New Ukraine Howitzers Make Headlines, while the M109 gun toils in obscurity. So what this was um, talking about back in uh, back a few days ago was that uh, you hear about Caesars, you hear about um, uh, Panzer Hits of 2000s, but actually these M109s are plodding, average, quite old, self-propelled howitzers are doing quite a bit of legwork in Ukraine, but they're not getting the headlines because, okay, they can't shoot and scoot so quickly. Okay, this and that. I'll put a link to this article. I'm not going to read it now, but it is really, really uh, good. So admittedly, the M109 is a relatively boring middleweight platform filling a niche already occupied by Ukraine's existing supply of Soviet-era M109 knockoffs, the S uh, 2S1 uh, Grodzika uh, 122mm gun, the S uh, 2S3 Akatas Akatsia, a 152 mil gun and the S219 and MSTA 152 self propelled howitzer. So it's an equivalent, but actually, they need stuff like this. You know, as it says, lobbing shells 13 to 25 miles is good. I mean, it's it's pretty. It's pretty average otherwise, you know, in, in, in all its ways, like the speed is pretty slow. Uh, its range is pretty average, but these are super useful. And the fact there's another 18 of these going with support vehicles is really big news um also finland has promised to uh leopard 2 tanks if other people start giving leopards and main battle tanks so finland really has stepped up to the plate and said yeah we'll do it if you but i don't want to do it alone but we'll do it together hugely important um on the flip side to that this is what the russians are sending to the front line uh an echelon of soviet era bmd ones Right. These are old school. Now, I know that America are providing a whole bunch of M113 APCs, but, and these have been fed, uh, sent to Jankoy, um, but these are old school, you know, old school amphibious APCs, IFVs, um, infantry fighting vehicles used from 1969 to present, um, designed in the, in the mid-60s. That is, so when you... What I'm saying is compare this and the talk of leopard tanks and the Marders, the Bradleys uh, and uh, the French uh, vehicle that's being sent. And then what does Russia have in answer to this? And this is so important that consistently the Ukrainians are being upgraded and they're getting better and better kit, more and more kit. And consistently the Russian forces are being downgraded in terms of equipment and in terms of personnel. Um, and they are, uh, yeah. in fact, the personnel are not getting the training that the uh, Ukrainian forces are getting. So actually, the personnel are getting upgraded in terms of the huge amounts of training being put into them. Um, so this, there's an asymmetry there that that is a kind of a seesaw dipping in favour of Ukraine with each and every single week and each and every single uh, uh, um, assistance package, um, equipment package, aid package that goes to Ukraine. It's a massive, massive difference. Uh, and then as we come towards the, the end of the kind of news, I want to say there's another uh, stats sheet for the stockpiles of Russian missiles that's come out. This one, the last one came out in November, showing that you had these percentages. This is as according to Ukrainian intelligence, these percentages of rockets left 
Um, and now you have so, sort of 11% of Iskander left. So they made 36, so they had 800 stockpile, but they've used 744. So they've got 11% of them left, 44% uh, of, of the, another type of Iskander, uh, but they didn't have very many of those, so, so on and so forth. This is fascinating. 9% of Calibers, 16% um, of KH101s, KH555. Um, and when it comes down to other ones like the uh, the Kinzel, they've got 84%, but actually they have very few of those. And the headline figure there is 19% of their total strategic missiles left. That is really low, and they are using them at unsustainable rates. Yes, they, they've made 290 since the beginning of the war, but they are using those up really quickly of the KH-101s and the KH-555s. Um, so on and so forth and you come down to tactical missiles and they're in a lot better shape so these ballistic missiles like the s300 surface to air missile that can be used in the secondary mode for ground attack they've got 83 percent of them left and that's why we're starting to see well not start we i think we are seeing more and more s300s being used in the field um and yeah there you go i think that is uh so 78 percent of those types of missiles left whereas they've only 90 percent of the more sort of cruise missile types left that if that is true of course that's the caveat how accurate are the, these claims but this is uh, very interesting because it means if it is true the russia are, are are really eating into their strategic reserves that would mean they would just if they went to war with nato proper they would have nothing left in the tank to use they, their stockpiles would be depleted and they really are worryingly low on these sorts of missiles they would be Sort of wiped out pretty quickly the russians if they went to proper war uh what they do have are conscripts you know mobilized conscripts three hundred thousand so far very soon to be five hundred thousand. there it looks like there's going to be a big mobilizing mobilization drive either was i think was it the 12th or 17th was the latest uh intelligence coming out but there's also other intelligence to suggest it hasn't stopped it's actually been going on the entire time there has been no stop to mobilization and it's continual Anyway, uh, this source says that actually Ukraine's defences will have very hard days in 2023 and 24 because Russia can just throw endless numbers of uh, humans at the problem. Uh, there's lots of debate in that, obviously, as well. Right, onto the front lines. As per normal, let's start in the northeast. So we're going to go to the Kupians, to Svatva, to Kremina front line here. Uh, and not a lot to report, really. Quite a lot of positional fighting. So just northeast of Kupiansk, we have uh, Tavuljanka, Liman Pershi, Vilshana, and Persho Trevneva. We have Defmon here saying the Ukrainians are repulsed an attack in the area of Stelmakivka. I'll talk about that in a second. Ukrainians reported shellings in the area of Tavuljanka and Vilshana, which could indicate the Ukrainians are closing in on the towns. This has been uh, sort of touted for some time now. However, it does appear that the fighting around here is fairly positional, um, but it could be that those two, uh, the Ukrainians are moving closer to those two towns. Other than that, we hear, you know, Stelmakivka again, fighting around here, uh, repelled attacks in that direction. Uh, the Russians claim that the Ukrainians uh, had a failed attack on Kuzumivka. Uh, we heard previously there's uh, nighttime attacks uh, happening in the Kuzumivka area as the Ukrainians are using sort of slightly different tactics, maybe than the normal kind of positional artillery-based fighting that we see around here quite a lot. And Mikivka, as we come further down south, we have Mikivka here. So we set up the uh, logistics layer on the map. We see that the R66 or P66 highway coming down here um, is, is super important, obviously, for the Ukrainians in breaking that line between Svatova and Kremina. Well, Mikivka, there's a lot of fighting around there. Ploschchanka and Chavonopopivka again, but nothing too much to report. No report says, last 24 hours, we saw a lot of videos appear from the Dubrova area west of Kremina. So let's wait out the news uh, that the Ukrainians are gradually moving forward, he thinks there. Um, and Mikivka, Ploschchanka, I will get to that. I sort of jumped the gun there. Kremina, you... Ukrainians repulsed attacks around Makivka and Ploschchanka. Shellings reported in the area of Dubrova and Kuzmyrna. This most likely means the Ukrainians are close to those settlements. So again, nothing different to what we've been hearing. Uh, Rebar says very little, actually, on, on the whole area. 
Um, but although it does say that in the Liman sector, the enemy attempted to storm positions of the Russian 3rd Motor Rifle Division of the 20th Army near Zhuravka Gully, but failed and retreated. So the ISW here says another Russian military bogger claimed that Ukrainian forces attempted several unsuccessful counterattacks to regain lost positions along the Balka Zaravka River that runs between Ploschanka and Kremina. This is the area I told you about previously, and I I took it off as to be contested, but I had the Russians taking some ground here just south of Ploschanka, where it looks like the Ukrainians attempted some counterattacks around there. So it could well be actually given that information that the the Russians really do have so, some of this ground here there's a sort of river gully there a river gully here and they taken the high ground I think between those two around there so I, I think that would be fair to interpret that information in that way although I can't be exact about the the land but as uh, as mentioned, shelling around Dibrova, around Kuzmyrna, which is this settlement just here, which indicates that the Ukrainians are around there, but that's been the case for a good week or so now. I have no exact details on what is going on uh, in this forested area other than the claims that, and this comes from uh, Rebar as well, that there are reconnaissance and sabotage groups operating uh, for the Ukrainians in this area. So... That's what you'd expect, of course, given that there are lots of rumours about uh, an oncoming big attack towards Kremina or somewhere around here. But, you know, Kremina has felt the pressure over the last week or so or a couple of weeks. Now, Spirne has been mentioned, but otherwise it's all about Bakhmut. So as we move further down here, uh, down south, we have Spirne where um, no report says Russian forces reportedly attacked near Spirna. No success has been reported so far. Um, uh, and then it's all about Solidar. So as we come down past uh, this southerly Bilirivka, we move on to Yakolivka and Solidar. If you were to interpret this whole situation as uh, charitably as possible for the Ukrainians, this would be... Uh, tactical withdrawal rather than being overrun at the end of the day they were flanked and being partially surrounded you've got only a few options either you do a counter-attack to stop yourself being flanked so that'd be a huge counter-attack all along here they obviously didn't have the uh, capacity to do that um, or you uh, defend valiantly um, or but if you defend valiantly, there's a strong chance you're going to be flanked and then encircled and then completely wiped out or at least take severe losses. Or you you move back at, you know on your own terms. So there's a tactical withdrawal, perhaps, of the Ukrainians around here where they realised that they were not going to win this one. So they t took up stronger positions further back. However, it's not looking good in Solidar. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So this day, supposedly, of ceasefire, we saw the Russians make some some pretty significant gains. As you can see, I don't know if you remember the map from yesterday, but the Russians have made some gains just to the west of Yakolivka, moving towards this railway line that goes sort of north-south, uh, past, uh, actually connects the salt mines and goes past Solidar, up to Krasnopolivka. So there's this move towards Krasnopolivka, Rodsdolivka and Vesely up here as they are, are trying to do this larger encirclement of Bakhmut but also use that as a launch pad to further movement uh, north and perhaps west. So obviously cutting off this rail line and the road behind it will be super important for the Russians. There have it's been so much talk about what's been going on in Soldar for the last sort of uh, 24 hours. Um, there have been a, a lot of movements in. I mean, this is War Gonzo's map uh, showing that this salt, this is actually, I think, a, partly a tourist area, um, but also is a salt mine connecting to uh, passages below the ground here. Now, there are passages elsewhere, entrances and exits elsewhere, sort of, I think, I believe here and up here. Uh, there's talk of a lot of ammunition and supplies stored under there. And there's obviously a very real threat that the Russians now have control over some of these exits to the, the mine system. And they could get hold of that that equipment, which would be a, a, a big loss for the Ukrainians and a big boon for the Russians. So that's, that's a real 
um, challenge for the Ukrainians. The Russians are certainly right in the middle of the Solodar now. The whole of Bakhmutsky and the southern part of the Solodar are completely under their control. I mean, yesterday, uh, reporting Ukraine was talking about these warehouses still being under Ukrainian control. The occasional map still has them having some kind of presence down there. I would dispute that, and I would say it looks pretty uh, safe to say that the Ukrainians are well out of, of the middle part of Solodar now. And that it's all fighting about the the mines and the central part of Solidar. In fact, you know, once that goes, then that's Solidar pretty much in trouble. There's still a lot of area here to fight over and the Ukrainians will be dug in here. So the argument, as I was saying earlier, is that they did a tactical retreat to get to take up better positions that are well dug in here. And it's not all over in Solidar, but things are certainly... Um, in the momentum is certainly with the Russians. Um, there is uh, video evidence to suggest that, you know, they're doing well. There are video from Wagner PMC fighters from the built up area of Solidar, which is currently being stormed by the musicians. So says Reba actually quoting from Milinfo live. Um, it's too early to claim control of the city. According to the fighters uh, it is too early, but they are pretty confident. Uh, and Reba, you know, says uh, uh, actually not an awful lot on Solidar, considering they could. Um, a lot of information is coming from other sources, including, you know, a lot of Ukrainian sources that are saying, yeah, it is pretty difficult. Wagner PMC says no reports have captured the southern part of Solidar and most of Bakhmutsky. They were visually confirmed inside the centre of Solidar. Ukrainian forces were seen pulling back to the northern part, clashes ongoing east of Solidar and also west, just north of Bakhmutsky. Uh, so that would be um, around here. I mean, you know, the exact details of this is unknown. It could be up here, uh, around here, and to the east could be, you know, around here towards Krasnohora. We hear that there are repelled attacks towards Krasnohora as well. Uh, it, it this this is an important place. I mean, Ukraine really does want to hold Solidar for the obvious reasons, and not just logistics, but it, the encirclement then starts getting more threatening for Bakhmut in general. If this road is cut off, the next one to go would be this one, and that only leads the roads from uh, the west moving into Bakhmut. But even the one here that goes through Ivanivska, potentially under threat, as some maps have the Russians actually controlling all of this area here. Uh, and if that's the case, then that road is certainly under uh, threat. I mean, as far as I understand... There's quite a lot of artillery action around there anyway. So it is it is looking um, pretty dubious for the for the Ukrainians, certainly up in the northern areas here. And I'm sure there'll be lots of news coming out today about it. The most positive thing I've seen is journalist uh, Yuri Butasov sends a message this morning from the salt mine in Solodar, where a group of PMC Wagner mercenaries reportedly broke into yesterday. Apparently, the Ukrainians counterattacked overnight. He mentioned the newly created 46th Brigade now defends the city. What you might see is that because the Ukrainians don't want this to be a big PR loss, you might see a whole load of stuff being poured into Solodar and a really big counterattack taking place so that this doesn't become a big PR win, but also a tactical win for the PMC in the area. Prigozhin, uh, who's in charge of Wagner PMC, is being really big on selling this as a huge uh, Wagner victory or in the making, as in this is Wagner, not the Russian uh, you know, ordinary forces. However, we are aware that that the airborne, there are airborne divisions, there are actually other people operating for the for the Russian forces in the area as well. Um, the ISW pretty much says exactly what I've been saying there. Uh, one military blogger claimed that Russian troops advanced near as far as Krasnopilia, uh, which is four kilometers northwest of Solodar, and the Ukrainian group in Bakhmut is under threat of encirclement as well. If we come down from Solidar and look to Bakhmut, uh, fighting, I think, in Pudorodny on the outskirts there, um, and claims from Rebar that, uh, and others that there, there's a lot of pressure on the east here. Uh, I still think Ukrainians hold the waste uh, sorting plant, although Deep State has that, which is a pro-Ukrainian source, has that under Ukrainian control on their map. 
But just judging from what Rebar said yesterday, I think that's still in, in Ukrainian hands. But there is pressure from the east. Um, and Opitny, a bit of a change there. I think Ukrainians have, uh, Ukrainians have actually lost some territory in Opitny as well. As according to most maps, that seems to be where the Russian lines go. So that means that uh, the Ukrainians around there are, again, under a lot of pressure. So it seems like the pressure is you know, all over the shop uh, in terms of Bakhmut. However, Defmon says, as an example, that things are somewhat more stable south, and that could mean Klyshivka, Klis Kodimivka, and places around there, uh, because all of the pressure seems to be applied to the north. So I don't know whether some of the forces have been moved to the north opportunistically as the Russians realise that they have got some momentum gathered in uh, Solidar. Uh, so we see, I've changed the map, slight gains here for the Russians uh, between Opitny and Klyshchivka, but Klyshchivka appears to be repelled, uh, Russian attacks again, so a bit of stasis there. A bit of movement for the Russians here, as you can see in my map, I'll change the Ukrainian lines later, um, just to the northwest of Kodiamivka, but again, repelled attacks around there, um, so on and so forth. The ISW says the Ukrainian State Border Guard Service emphasized that Ukrainian forces neutralized the Russian grenade launch point in the Bakhmut direction to prevent preparations for another Russian counterattack in the area, but no specifics about that. Other than that, it's just the normal sort of repelled attacks, so on and so forth. Um, and Rebar saying exactly what I've to told you already. Uh, uh, and Defmon say, I've not seen any signs of any major movement in this direction in the last few days. As Klyshivka and Kurdi Mivka, it's possible that they're using most assets in the Solidar area. So there we go. Uh, we'll move on to further down south, but it is going to be all about Bakhmut in the, in the next week. I can guarantee that. And going forward, this is certainly the main point of contention, uh, really up and down the entire front line. So when we come down to look at Avdivka, there's just not a lot to report. Repulse attacks in Pervomysky is pretty much all I understand that's happened around there. Uh, Defmon says, out of interest, uh, the Ukrainians repulsed attacks around Pervomysky, Mayorsk and Pobieda. Uh, it's possible we'll see increased activity in this area soon. The Russians have sent support to the LDNR units in the area. Rebar says uh, pretty much usual. Russian servicemen continue to squeeze the enemy from the center of the western outskirts of Marienka. So Marienka is further down south here, uh, south of uh, Donetsk and Avdivka. And they say, again, they're pushing the, Rus the Ukrainians out from the center to the western outskirts. They've been saying that for weeks and there appears to be no change. Now, just the point of interest here. So this is the ISW saying... The Donetsk People's Republic DNR People's Militia posted graphic video footage reportedly of the aftermath of the of an attack by the DNR 5th Brigade on a Ukrainian grouping in Marienka. Military bloggers amplified the footage to highlight the intensity of operations in Marienka. Now, when you actually follow these uh, claims uh, and you go to the source material, here is uh, a, a video on telegram now i won't show you the video it's got one dead body uh, of a guy that was injured that carried on fi firing and then was killed but the video claims that three people were killed in this in fact let's translate that for you um uh, so let's select this this text here and go to google translate so it says uh, fighters of the 5th Brigade destroyed a group of militants of the armed forces of Ukraine in the Mar Marinsky direction during the battle. The fighters of the 5th Brigade of the 1st AK destroyed three militants of the armed forces of Ukraine. So that's three people dying. Uh, the body of one of them was evacuated. This militant, already wounded, refused to surrender and continued to shoot back, after which he was destroyed. Um, so... That is that is this big claim, right? I mean, it's not necessarily a big claim, but you might think it is, as you have this report in ISW as they aggregate all the reports from all these different uh, sources around the information space on both sides. Uh, and this is a report that was amplified. But what's happened here is, and I don't mean to belittle this, because there's three human lives lost, right? And this is terrible, and the human cost of this is awful. But when you zoom out and you think about these statistics when uh, the Ukrainians say today 490 people have died of, of the Russians and you're trying to work out where these all come from and how big, big uh, a rep how representative these are and how big 
a day it's been, so on and so forth. When the Russians are amplifying a claim that three people have been killed in Marienka, when you look at that in the whole scale of the war, this is this is not a big thing. And it is terrible for those people and their families, etc., etc., obviously. But this is an amplification, and this seems like, oh, this is a big success. And then you might have Rebar then saying, oh, you know, we're pushing them out to the western outskirts because, you know, look at this big claim, and we've got graphic footage, and actually it's just one dead body, and they're talking about killing three people overall, and that's all it is. Uh, it, it isn't the big, you know, success. Although... There is something to be said that a lot of these fights are small units, small groups of people fighting. It isn't big military waves like you might expect in World War Two and World War One. There's just an awful lot of very small military engagements that go on. You might call these battles in certain places, but they are skirmishes often. And the overall battle of Marienka will be building to building. And uh, losing one point might be no one dying and just a small building being overtaken by the other by the enemy and that becoming a firing point and actually it's in the whole scheme of things it's not a huge win or loss right in this case three people died and the russians are shouting loudly about this anyway i just thought i'd try and give you uh, some perspective over the claims other than that there there's basically no there's another makalivka i think a repulse attack around there but no claims of anything in zaporizhia from the russians as far as i can work out uh, and then so it's other sorts of claims concerning Kherson and Crimea. One of the only other points to mention in in that area, uh, in Kherson, is the claims about the Kimburn Peninsula. So we go to Rebar, they say the Ukrainians are probably preparing a landing on the Kimburn Peninsula. A Ukrainian Bayraktar drone is operating over Ochakiv in and the Dnieper Dnieper estuary to monitor the situation on the peninsula command post of the ukrainian's 126 brigade was set up on the Berislav machine building plant um so although Berislav, that's nothing to do with that first part there let's just concentrate on that first part the isw reports this russian sources that would be rebar claim that russian forces conducted operations uh the ukrainian forces conducted operations on the kimbed spit in mikhailiv oblast and hold positions on the island in the dnipro river in kurson oblast on january the 6th on that island being the uh, Veliki uh, Potemkin Island. Uh, a Russian military blogger claimed that Ukrainian forces are currently conducting reconnaissance activities in the area of the Kimburn Spit. So that is uh, that is rebar for sure. Um, so it could be stuff going on uh, on the Kimburn Peninsula. Uh, probably is. Uh, Ochakiv is there. That so that this is seems to be the place as I think uh, marine training base there and uh, different sort of installations at Ochakiv. So that quite get, often gets hit by artillery from the Russian side uh, and uh, Gimler's or no uh, multiple launch rocket systems as well, uh, not guided ones. Um, but there you've got this s small island in the uh, river estuary in the sort of delta area of the Dnipro, which has been the sign of uh, the site of fighting between the Ukrainians and the Russians. The Ukrainians uh, flew a flag from there the other day. And I, I'm not sure it's got particular uh, strategic or tactical advantage uh, at all. Um, the Spetsnaz apparently was seen shooting at the island yesterday, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure that will amount to all that much. So I don't want to be so biased that I am just painting this in, in a delightful Ukrainian way. But realistically, I think, it yes, it's going bad for the Ukrainians in Bakhmut, but that's not the end of the world because I, I just can't see the Russians doing anything um, significant uh, going forward. I just don't think they have the capacity to remotely, well, they can't win the war, but even to win certain areas in a long-term sustainable way anyway that's my opinion disagree if you like but please substantiate your claims uh i've uh, i'll try and get out a ukraine war update extra video today it is difficult on a saturday um but thank you for your support uh please like subscribe and share toodle pips